So here we are, second video taking a look at consumer theory. And this one what we're going to be taking a look at is how to actually determine what is that optimal ratio, how much milk, how many cookies should you consume in order to get that optimal, right, that highest level of satisfaction given your resources that you have. And then we'll take all of this, we'll play around with, okay, how do we respond? How do we change our consumption bundles for a changing price? To be honest, that gets a bit messy, right? We start having this change in quantity, change in utility. It gets a little bit confusing as we have lots of different effects going on, but we'll go through it. We'll work through that. It's not so bad. We'll take all of that in the end. We'll bring it together to build personal demand curves. And then from those personal demand curves, we'll see how we can aggregate across individuals to take a look at our market demand altogether. So that's our plan for today. Uh, let's start off though with that quick review. We're gonna just touch on again what we mean by utility, marginal utility, and then right back to the start of the course, scarcity, choice, opportunity cost. So we'll take a look at how all of this fits together. It really brings everything we've looked at this semester really all together, not quite the producer theory so far, that will come together in the next chapter, but we're gonna to begin to kind of bring all these building blocks and put them together. We're kind of making our big Lego structure here. So things are starting to kind of, they're gonna to start to come together and kind of make a bit of sense hopefully by the end of this. Let's take a look at that. Okay, so to refresh ourselves, what we're looking at is we're looking at this idea of utility which is essentially this measurement of happiness or satisfaction. We have that, okay, typically as we increase our consumption of a given good, that is we have more quantity consumed within a given time period, our utility, our satisfaction, our happiness will increase, right? More stuff consumed, more satisfaction, typically what we would witness. But this isn't just like linear. It's not just like, hey, forever, the more and more stuff I eat, the more and more satisfaction I get. No, 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 this is going up, but at a decreasing rate. That is, we would ex expect that as our consumption goes up, as we're consuming more and more and more goods, quantity consumed is increasing. For every additional good received, my marginal utility, that is the satisfaction I receive from that incremental unit, right? That extra cookie, how much extra satisfaction do I get? Well, for every extra cookie, I'm gonna get less and less extra satisfaction. That is, I'm witnessing this diminishing marginal utility. And we took a look at what that means for our graphs between the two, that hey, my total utility is kind of increasing, right? Again, if I were just do a really cheap kind of uh, freehand of this, say, okay, there's my utility. Utilities going up, but then kind of plateauing where my marginal utility versus quantity, it's starting off high and then it's kind of falling off, approaching zero. As I consume a lot of something, I don't get very much extra satisfaction anymore. So very low extra satisfaction as I consume lots. Well, then we take a look at this, okay, we said, okay, that our firm, or not our firms, wow, we're in consumer theory. Our consumers, our consumers, the reason why they consume, the reason why we decide to buy things is that we are aiming to maximize our satisfaction, maximize our happiness, or maximize our utility. So utility maximization, this is the key. And right, we take a look at this and we're like, well, wait, why don't I just consume maximum amount of quantity, that's the highest possible level of total utility I could receive. Well, okay, if we lived in a one good world, maybe that would be the case, but we don't, right? We live in a many good world, but if we were to break it down and kind of think of it as two goods, well, keep in mind that to buy these two goods, well, you have scarcity, right? You have these scarce resource of money, of time, that is the time you could devote to consuming these goods, or your ability to consume these two goods, right? There's a scarce resource here. So that means that you have to make choices. You have to choose, right? Okay, how much of good A do I buy versus how much of good B do I buy? How much of good A do I consume versus how much of good B do I consume? All right, you have scarce reason, you only have scarce amount of room in your belly, right? If you're going to consume both pizza and pop, well, how much pizza? How much pop? Right? You have to make this choice. If you just consumed all pizza, 
Well, you're not going to be able to drink any coffee. You're going to be really thirsty come the end, right? Just physically, there's not room. You're going to be in pain at that point. So choices. These choices, well, our final bit is that they then necessitate an opportunity cost. That is, that opportunity cost is what you've given up in the one good in order to consume the good you've chosen. So our opportunity costs come into play here as well. So our example that we're going to look at in order to calculate this, in order to work through this, let's presume very simply that we have $4. And luckily for us, we have a real hankering for cookies. And well, we're also thirsty, so we also want to consider milk. Luckily, luckily cookies, they're on sale. And our price of our cookie is only a dollar. Even better, milk is also on sale, and we can get a cup of milk again for only a dollar, right? And yes, I'm just making these a dollar. This just turns out for our introduction to make everything a lot easier. As we move on, we'll complicate things. We'll make the prices different. We'll make the prices not be just one. But for now, it makes things everything a lot easier. We could take a look from this, then our budget line, and in fact, this is what we looked at at the end of the last video, is we said, okay, if we had, uh, let's put milk up on our vertical, I don't know where I put it in the last video, and we'll put cookies on our horizontal, maybe I had these reversed now that I think about it, but that's fine. If we were to then draw this budget line, oh, I wanted a straight line, let's try that again. If we then draw this budget line, we have our trade-off points. We could consume all four cups of milk. We could consume four cookies, or we have all of our possible consumption bundles in the middle there, right? Such that we had, I don't know, maybe something like that is three and one. Maybe that's two and two one and four, right? So just to give it some context, three, two, one, zero, one, two, and three, right? Now, okay, here we're gonna get into a big fundamental assumption in that we'll use throughout this entire course, but is very common in economics as well. And that is the assumption of everything being infinitely divisible. Now, okay, for this example, it's highly constructed so that everything works out to be a whole number. But what we need to keep in mind is that technically, if, we, if this was not infinitely divisible, we wouldn't have a line here. We wouldn't have a budget line. We would just have a series of budget points, right? That is, I could consume at four and zero, three and one, two and two, one and three, or zero and four, right? I could just consume at those points and that's it. So I wouldn't have a continuous line, I just have these points. Well, by drawing this line, by having a budget line being drawn, oh man, wrong tool again. By having a budget line being drawn, what this actually implies is that it would be technically possible to have something like, I don't know, 2.5 glasses of milk and 1.5 cookies, right? That implies that, that was actual, that's actually a possible consumption bundle. Now, okay, that seems a little odd. Um, the way that we come across this, the way that we kind of fix this problem is we either deal with such large quantities that it makes sense, like, hey, this is actually 4,000 cookies, so no, that's not 1.5, that's 1,500. Or the other way is we just kind of wave our hands and say, yeah, okay, it's impractical, but it's an abstraction from reality. It's a way that the math kind of works a lot more simply for us. And it just, it works to explain the world around us with that little bit of hand waving. So to be honest, you don't need to get too caught up with that. You don't need to get too worried about, oh, what, what's this infinitesimally divisible? What, we have just points, not a line. No, 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 don't get too caught up with it. It's just kind of be aware Technically, that's the reality of drawing a line, is that you could have these little weird decimal points, and that's okay. That's okay, right? It may not make sense when we're dealing with four cups of milk and four cookies, but we'll wave our hands and we'll say that it works.
What we want to look at is we want to take a look at, okay, we've drawn it as an actual budget line here, looked at all our consumption bundles. Let's actually just draw it as a table. And let's take a look at this table of, okay, what is our quantity of cookies, price of cookies, and then what are all these trade-offs look like? So let's draw that table to start off. So what am I looking at here? I would need, let's draw a vertical line. And I'm going to look at price of cookies. And well, that's just one. Let's, um, just to kind of keep things neat, rather than just drawing down, let's just make a whole bunch of lines, just so that as I freehand this, I can kind of keep it, oh, I can kind of keep things in line, keeps me from drifting up or drifting down as I write my responses. So there we go, that should be enough space. So I have my price of cookies. And then I'm gonna have my quantity of cookies, which I can consume. So quantity of cookies. Let's say, well, let's go and start off with the scenario where we have zero cookies. And then I can go up and I can have one cookie, two, three, or four cookies. Right, and all I did here is say, okay, zero cookies, one, two, three, and four. What we're then gonna look at next is say, okay, well, what's my price of milk? versus my quantity of milk. And again, okay, price, that's easy. This is one all the way down. Quantity of milk. For quantity of milk here, what would we have? If we have zero cookies, well, we're gonna have four cups of milk. If we have one cookie, three, two, one, and then finally zero. All right, so okay, we have all of our possible different consumption bundles, zero, four, one, three, two, two, right? All oh, essentially we've just listed all of these points along our budget line. We could finally, right, if we just wanted to make sure, hey, did we do this right? We could take a look at our total expense, right? And in our total expense in this case is, well, how much money have we spent on milk and cookies? Well, okay, what would we do? We'd do price times quantity plus price times quantity. So zero cookies, so one times zero is zero, one times four is four. One times one is one, plus one times three is three, so one and three is four. And then if we did this right, it should be four all the way down. That is right, keep in mind our budget in this case, we had $4 to devote to milk and cookies. So all of our kind of consumption bundles that are available to us, should be such that we're using all of our resource, all of that money that was available to us. So in this case, yeah, okay, it's showing up where, where we want to be. It's good. What we want to take a look at next then is kind of the utility that we're getting from cookies and the utility we're getting from milk. Keep in mind when we go through milk, it's going to be a little bit backwards. It's going to look funny because we're starting at zero down and then we're working up. So we'll start with cookies first and we'll work through that. Let me just change colors to work through this. Let's go and go marginal utility of cookies. And this year, I'm just gonna assume that we have like this linear preference that is we're gonna start at some value, maybe our satisfaction is on a scale of zero to five. So five being awesome satisfaction. And then as we go down less and less and less, and let's just presume, right, just to be simple, Let's say that, hey, zero cookies, well, zero cookies, zero satisfaction, right? But as I go from zero to one, let's say I get another plus five satisfaction. As I go from one to two, that's gonna give me plus four, plus three, and then plus two, right? So law of diminishing marginal utility, the more and more cookies I have, the less and less extra happiness I receive. Milk then, let's take a look at that. Marginal utility of milk. Okay, keep in mind it's going the other way. Quantity of zero is at the bottom and going up. And let's presume we have the exact same preferences. So zero, first glass of milk I get is plus five, four, three. Oh, that's not a three, what happened there? 
three, and then two. Right, so okay, and we kind of have to think when we're working through this marginal utility kind of thing, we got to kind of work through it all just individually. Right, so just focusing on milk, if I consume extra milk, extra milk, extra milk, what's happening? Let's then work out finally, and maybe I need to extend my lines a little bit in order to actually have this work out. Okay, what I want to work out is my total utility from cookies, my total utility from water, and then work out, okay, what's my total utility altogether from both goods, right? I'm getting so much satisfaction from cookies, so much satisfaction from milk, and we'll see that our, you know, complete satisfaction that's available to us is going to be maximized at only one of these possible consumption bundles. And let's take a look at that. So to start off, let's take a look at our, I don't need the right tool. Let's start off with our utility of cookies. So, okay, zero cookies, I'm getting zero utility, zero satisfaction. As I went from zero to one cookie, I got plus five satisfaction. So zero plus five is five. As I continued going up, so okay, as I went from one to two cookies, I got plus four satisfaction, so five and four is nine. Two to three gave me another plus three satisfaction, so nine and three is 12. And then finally for that last cookie, only gave me plus two satisfaction, so 12 and two is 14. We can do the same thing now for our milk. Let's take a look at that. So the utility of milk is going to be, and we'll start right, because we're zero at the bottom, increasing our quantity as we go up. So very similarly, we'll start at the bottom, zero. As I go from zero cook, sorry, zero glass of milk to one glass of milk, I get plus five satisfaction, so five. And then if you take a look at it, right, our marginal utility for milk was identical preference as to cookies. So it's just going to go in the same way. And it's going to be five, nine, 12 and 14. So we have our utility from cookies, we have our utility from milk, and in the way that we've structured this, they're identical, just going in reverse ways. What we then want to calculate is our total utility from our consumption bundles. And what we're going to do to work this out is just going to say, okay, for consumption bundle one, so our first row here. How much utility from cookies plus how much utility from milk? Zero plus 14 is, well, 14. Second row, five utility from cookies, 12 from milk. Well, that's going to be 17. Nine and nine is 18. 12 and five is 17. 14 and zero is 14. Okay. If we are utility maximizing, that is, we want to find a consumption bundle such that we have the most satisfaction we could possibly get from these two choices. Where's that point? Well, the place where I get the highest level of possible satisfaction is this third row here. That is, my satisfaction is maximized at two cookies and two glasses of milk. That is, if I were wanting to identify this, that would be right up there on my budget line. At that point, I would have a utility maximizing consumption bundle. If we want to kind of use our language that we introduced earlier, any point along this budget line would be an efficient consumption bundle. That is, I'm utilizing all my resources. But although any point here is efficient, this one, this is our optimal consumption bundle. This is my utility maximizing point of consumption. So, okay, how exactly can we figure that out? That was a lot of work in order to find a utility maximizing point. Please, let's hope there's an easier way so we don't have to go through this table for every possible time we're looking at a trade-off between two goods. And no, we don't have to go through this table each time. This was just kind of demonstrative. What we can take away is that this whole point where we're gonna be maximizing Right? We're going to do just a little bit of waving our hands. We're not going to prove this. We're not going to go through it. We don't have the math skills at the intro level here. 
So what we're going to notice is that, hey, this, uh, this line, this row, such that we're maximizing, that's just, there we go. So that row that we're maximizing, what we'll notice is that in that row there, we have marginal utility, marginal utility being one and the same. That is the extra satisfaction I'm getting from cookies is the same as the extra satisfaction I'm getting from milk. In this case here, I'm getting the same extra satisfaction from each. At this point, I am utility maximizing. So, okay, right now the way that that looks, the way that that looks is that marginal utility from cookies equals our marginal utility from milk is our utility maximizing point. That's not the full story. This is actually an artifact, a construct of the way that we've structured this example. Truthfully, the way that we'd want to think of this is we'd want to find the point where our marginal utility of cookies per dollar spent on cookies is equal to the marginal utility we get from milk per the price we spend on milk. In our case, the price of both of these was one and the same and one dollar. So it worked out, boom, we just see it as the marginal utility is equal. But if we had introduced a different price or different prices between the goods, we would have not had that pop out as easily. And we would have had to work out instead a marginal utility per dollar. So it would have been a little bit different. But let's think about let's think about why this is the case, why this would be a utility maximizing situation. And in order to do so, let me just clean things up a little bit so we can see it. Okay, let's take a look at what would happen if we were to be at a different row. What would happen if we would be at row two here? That is, if we would be consuming one cookie and three glasses of milk. Well, okay, if I were to think about this, I would have a marginal utility of cookies of five versus a marginal utility of milk of three. That is, for the last cookie that I had, I got a lot more satisfaction from it than my last glass of milk. So, right, if we think about that in terms of satisfaction per dollar, well, I'm getting a lot more satisfaction per dollar from cookies than I am from milk. If I want to maximize my satisfaction, I want to maximize my happiness or my utility, that means I want to buy more cookies. So buy more cookies in order to get more satisfaction and buy more cookies. Well, plus one cookie, one less milk. And I have this equal point such that my satisfaction per dollar is equivalent. From the other perspective, say we were at our other case, we were down over here having three cookies and one milk. Well, now I'm getting more satisfaction per dollar spent from milk than I am from cookies. So, hey, I want to maximize my satisfaction. I'm getting a lot of satisfaction per dollar spent on milk. So I want more milk. So as I go more milk, that means less cookies. And I wind up again at this point where the extra satisfaction per unit, per dollar spent is equivalent between both goods. So, okay, all of that, do you need to know it? Do you need to explain it? Really what we need to be able to do is we need to be able to identify this equation here, this identity and say, hey, our Utility maximization, utility max at this point. That is, we just need to recognize that a utility maximizing consumer will choose an optimal bundle of good X and good Y, or cookies and milk, such that the marginal utility per dollar is equalized across all goods consumed. So that's our big takeaway here. Let's take a look at an example as to how we utilize this and how a utility maximizing consumer would then change or re-optimize their consumption bundles given a change in the price, right? So some exogenous, some outside force causes the price to change. How do we readjust? We'll take a look at that next. So what we can take a look at is using our equation such that we have that marginal utility for some good X 
all over the price of x is equal to the marginal utility of some good y all over the price of y. Well, we can utilize this identity by realizing, okay, at this point, we have the optimal bundle, the optimal ratio between x and y. We have our utility maximizing consumption bundle occurring. What we can often realize is that, hey, okay, cool, Keith, this was nice if we lived in a two good world, but don't we live in like an n good world? Like, don't we have n goods available to us? That's just a way of saying lots of goods, right? Where n is how many exist altogether. Well, yeah, yeah, we do. And so truthfully, if we wanted to stretch this out, we could say that, hey, this is equal to the marginal utility of Z all over the price of Z, which is then equal to on and on and on and on. Thing is, is that because in this point here for us to be utility maximizing, our marginal utility per dollar must be equated across all goods, we can kind of make a little bit of a simplification. We can just go and say, okay, sure, all of this stuff, this is just going to be everything else, right? All other goods that we could possibly equate over. And then this X, this marginal utility of good X over price of X, this is our good of interest, right? So in this case here, even though, yeah, technically, if we wanted to think about it in our N dimensions, instead of just two dimensions, X and Y, we could think about it in N dimensions, but still just simplify it back down to two to be, okay, here's our good of interest, which is good X, marginal utility of X all over price of X, versus everything else we could possibly buy, which has to be equated, so that'd be our marginal utility of everything else y all over price of everything else y, right? And whatever these work out to be is fine because ultimately it's a ratio such that this ratio would be the same as z over z, a over a, right? On and on and on and on. So we could simplify things this way. Let's take a look at what happens if we have a scenario. So let's just jump pages. Let's take a look at what happens if we have a scenario such that we start off at this equilibrium, right? It's what I call an equilibrium. Let's really call it an optimal point. So marginal utility of good X over price of X equals marginal utility of Y all over the price of Y. And okay, we have this at this point here where utility maximizing, we're getting the best possible level of happiness that we can given our budget. But okay, right, keep in mind that's given our budget, so that means we have some budget constraint here, such that we are constrained between X and Y, and maybe we're at some point like that, maybe that's our budget line. And currently, right, if we want to just demonstrate where we might be, maybe we are somewhere like this. All right, so there we go. We have some value of X1, some value of Y1, such as this is where our optimal level of consumption is, such that this is true. Well, what happens if the price of one of our goods were to change? That is, what would happen if the price of X were to go up? Right, we give this some context. Maybe X is going to be cookies in this case. So let's just... Uh, Instead of X, let's call that cookies. So marginal utility of cookies, price of cookies. So, okay, we have quantity of cookies consumed there. And then instead of X1, we're going to have just cookie one, right? How many cookies that we're consuming? And then, oh no, we were consuming cookies. And now all of a sudden the price of cookies is going up. Well, let's keep in mind what's happening with this budget line. We only had so much money to devote to all other goods and cookies. And now the price of cookies has gone up. That is this extreme point over here, this extreme point, which occurs when I put all my money into cookies. Well, if I were to put all my money into cookies and cookies cost more, I can't buy as many cookies anymore. That is, you could imagine my entire budget line is going to rotate. Right, that's the big thing, it's going to rotate because the price of everything else is the same. So I'm still starting at the same point there. But now, I'm not able to buy as many cookies given this change in the price of cookies. So I would get a steeper 
a steeper budget line in this sense here. Okay, so here's the problem. Our problem is, is that our optimal consumption bundle used to be right there. But given that cookies are now more expensive and I can't buy as many cookies, my new budget line, the yellow one, makes my old consumption bundle unobtainable, right? This is now beyond my current budget constraint. I could not consume this point anymore given the rise in cookie prices. So, oh no, I need to re-optimize. I need to work out based off of this updated information, what's my new optimal ratio of cookies and everything else. Well, let's see what happens here. So first thing we want to do is we want to work out how this gets all messed up. So we would have our marginal utility of cookies all over. I'm going to call this P prime of cookies, right? Just say, hey, it's a new price. It rose, so new higher price. And then we're going to have the marginal utility of everything else all over our price of everything else. And I purposely jumped over this equal sign here, right? I did not include an equal sign because we had a change in price. We have some stuff going on. So, okay, what, what's this stuff going on? Well, okay, we had an increase in the price. Price is in the denominator. So what does that do to this overall term? It makes this overall term now smaller, right? As the price goes up, this whole term gets smaller which means if the two were initially equal, we now have a case such that I'm getting more extra happiness from the last dollar spent on everything else than I am from my last dollar spent on cookies. So in that case there, more extra happiness per dollar spent versus not as much extra happiness per dollar spent. Okay, keeping in mind, this should be kind of our big thing here. We are utility maximizing consumers. If I'm getting more extra happiness per dollar spent from everything else, that should mean that I want more of everything else. So let's take a look at what happens. This is gonna be known as our substitution effect. I'm just gonna short form that to subs for our substitution effect. And this is our first kind of effect that we're gonna be taking a look at. And in this, this is just strictly us substituting between our two goods, being like, hey, One's making me happier per dollar spent. I want more of that. And in order to get more of that, I have trade-offs, right? I have world scarcity, meaning I make choices. If I want more of Y, I have to give up C. So, okay, what does that mean? I'm gonna have some quantity of C. I'm gonna have some quantity of Y. Getting more extra happiness per dollar spent of Y. So I want more of everything else. And given that cookies are now more expensive, I'm getting less extra happiness per dollar spent. So in order to get more Y, I have to give up some of my cookies. As I go through this, right, we need to keep in mind that, hey, how much of something we have is directly related to our marginal utility of that. We have that law of diminishing marginal utility. So as I consume more of everything else, quantity everything else goes up, well, as I consume more of it, my marginal utility, that is the extra happiness I received from an extra unit, begins to shrink. My marginal utility of other goods becomes smaller and smaller and smaller because I'm having more of it, right? This is more slices of pizza, less extra satisfaction. But as I decrease my consumption of cookies, that level of happiness I got from that last cookie consumed is now increasing relative to where it was. So I have rising marginal utility of cookies. So I have my marginal utilities changing as such. On the other hand, what we also have, so we have the substitution, we'd also wanna consider what would be known as the income effect. And for our income effect, the way that we need to think about this is not in terms of our actual income as in our budget, but kind of in, what we would say, this is maybe more of a macro term, but what we refer to as our real income, right? That is like how much stuff we can buy. And what we realize is that by having the price of cookies go up, well, by the price of cookies going up, we cannot really have as much stuff available for us to buy. That is any time that our budget line is shrinking inwards due to an increase in prices, well, the way that we can think of this is that it's like we've had a drop in our income. 
we're going to feel relatively poorer because prices have gone up, income has stayed the same, we have less amount of things we can buy. Given that we have less income then, right, less income in this kind of sense, well, that means that with less income, I'm going to shift away. Less income means less to go towards cookies. And at the same time, that means less of everything else as well. So my income effect would cause my cookie consumption to fall. I feel poorer, so I don't want to be spending as much on cookies. And at the same time, I feel poorer, so I'm not going to want to be putting as much towards everything else. We still have this inverse relationship between our quantities and our marginal utilities. So as cookies fall, our marginal utility from cookies will actually rise. And then as everything else falls, our marginal utility from everything else will rise. Now, okay, especially here with our everything else good, we'll notice that we have these two effects going on. We have quantity of everything else going up, quantity of everything else dropping, and then marginal utilities, again, going the opposite direction. Sorry. That is marginal utility of everything else. What we need to keep in mind with this is that although these guys appear to be in conflict, first of all, well, we don't really need to worry about it because our focus, our good of analysis that we are analyzing is cookies. And okay, everything is in agreement here. So, well, that makes us feel good. On the other hand, what we typically witness is that the substitution effect is a large effect, while the income effect is typically speaking relatively small. We do have cases where we witness where we do have large income effects, but we're gonna wave our hands here in Econ 103 and we're going to say that the income effect is always a relatively small effect. So that being said, anytime we have a disagreement in direction, the substitution effect will always be the larger effect. It will always be the one that works, that wins out in this case here. So let's see what happens. Let's first take a look at our substitution effect. We'll take a look at that in blue. And then we'll take a look at our income effect and we'll take a look at our income effect in green. And we'll take a look at what that works out to. So first, first we're gonna have the substitution effect. So the substitution effect, that's gonna work out to say, hey, we're gonna be increasing our everything else. That means we're giving away cookies. So substitution effect, less cookies, more everything else. Then on the other side of things, we're going to have less of both sides. So that is going to be, again, a decrease. So oh, I said I was going to switch colors. My income effect is then decreasing the amount of cookies that I have in that sense there. Both of these effects together combine. And I get from that my new optimal consumption bundle at a point that we can call C2 and Y2 such that all together so okay there's my substitution effect working through there's my income effect working through and then less cookies all together more of everything else occurring so two effects working through ultimately giving me my final outcome and my new consumption bundle on my new budget line. So that's if we had a price, a price increase, right? Very similarly, we could work through a price decrease and see kind of how that guy works out. Let's take a look at that. So if again, we started off at this kind of optimal level, marginal utility of X, and actually let's just say it's cookies again. Marginal utility of cookies, all over the price of cookies. And this was equated with all of our other goods. Marginal utility of everything else, all over the price of everything else. In this case, oh, good things happen. Our price of cookies fall. So if cookie prices are falling, well, cookie prices are falling. That means that we end up with... Price of cookies falling, 
this whole term here has gotten bigger. So if we compare that with marginal utility of y all over price of y, we have the left side being bigger, meaning that given this low cheap price of cookies, at my current consumption bundle, I'm getting more satisfaction per dollar from cookies than I am from everything else. What does that mean? Well, it means that I'm going to have my substitution effect and I'm going to have my income effect to consider. Now, okay, keep in mind, we go through these separately and then we model them separately. Typically, the way that I go through it and most that you'll see go through substitution first and then income. There's no reason for that. Technically, they both happen simultaneously. So it's just we have to model one thing at a time. So, okay, for our substitution, what's happening? I'm getting more happiness per dollar from cookies. So what do I want more of? I want more cookies. Uh, compared to this, this is relatively less extra happiness per dollar. And in order to get more cookies, I have to give up everything else. So less of everything else. Law of diminishing marginal utility is I get more of cookies. The extra happiness I get from that last cookie is shrinking. As I get less of everything else, that extra happiness I received from the last unit is higher. Okay, over here on the income side, what's happening on the income side? Well, on our income side, prices are going down, meaning that now all else equal, I can buy more stuff. So more stuff, I'm going to feel richer. It's as if my income has just gone up. So given this kind of rise in income, a little bit more disposable income in that sense there, what happens? Well, I'm going to use some of this extra bit to buy more cookies, and I'm going to use some of this extra bit to buy more of everything else. So quantity cookies up, quantity of everything else up, and that's going to go across to marginal utility, marginal utility, and right, we have this inverse relationship Quantities go up, the more cookies I have, the less extra happiness I get. The more of everything else I have, the less extra happiness I get. This whole process goes through, marginal utility of cookies falling, marginal utility of cookies falling. Okay, that's gonna cause this left side to shrink. This whole process will work itself through until, I'm gonna go and put a little, prime on both of these guys to be like, hey, that's, that's my new one, my new marginal utility given these two changes, my new price given that change in price, and that's going to be equal to my marginal utility of y, right, again, marginal utility of y changed, so that's my new one changed, versus my price of y. Price of Y did not change, right? Price of Y stayed the same. Uh, everything else stayed the same. It was just cookies where the price changed. So in this case here, I had a price change. Prices fell. As prices fell for cookies, I buy more. I substitute to more cookies. Away from everything else, more cookies. Because the prices went down, I feel richer, so I'm going to buy a little bit more of everything else. Keeping in mind this income effect is relatively small. These two effects work in conjunction, changing my marginal utilities and quantity to marginal utility until I get a new re-optimized marginal utility of cookie all over price of cookies equals marginal utility of everything else all over price of everything else. That is at this point here, I am again utility maximizing. I am again utility maximizing. And I think we kind of jumped over that last point on that last example we looked at. Let's go back. Yeah, see, so we moved through. We saw how we moved along the budget line. We broke apart that, hey, we're going to have this substitution aspect. We're going to have this income aspect. But we never finished this off, right? That is, we wound up at this new point on our new budget line. But the big thing is we've had all of these changes occurring due to these changes in quantity of cookies and changes in quantity of everything else, such that same idea. These guys were now equated. And again, we have an optimal ratio of 
everything else to cookies, we have this optimal consumption bundle such that we are profit, sorry, not profit maximizing, I got producer theory stuck in my head, uh, such that at this point we are utility maximizing. We are earning the highest possible level of utility we can, the most satisfaction, the most happiness. So we are utility maximizing at that point there. What we can do, right, we took a look in this case, we took a look at our budget constraint and how we move from one budget constraint, change in price, our budget constraint rotated, and one optimal consumption bundle to the other optimal consumption bundle. What we can also look at is our personal demand for cookies. And that's all we can ever look at is our personal demand for cookies. And let's take a look at how we work through this. Uh, let's go and draw our axes here. So down here on the horizontal, we're gonna have our quantity of cookies. And then on the vertical, we're gonna have our dollar per cookie. That is, that's our price right? Price is dollar per cookie. How many dollars we give up for a cookie? To start off, where are we? Let's just pick a point. Doesn't really matter. We don't even know what the price is in this sense. Let's just say we have some price like that and we have some quantity that we are consuming. So hey, where those quantity and price points intersect, that gives us that point right there. Now let's make that a bit bigger. Oh, I'm using the wrong tool. There we go. We have our point, our initial one, where we have cookie one, and oh, let's give it an actual price. Let's call that $2. We don't have to, right? I could easily just call this P1 cookie one, but eh, let's actually give it, let's give it an actual value of $2. What we then had, what did we witness? We witnessed a fall in the price. Price of cookies went down. So, okay. Price of cookies went down. Given that fall in the price of cookies, what did we now have? We now had a new price down there, right? Again, if we wanted to give it context, we could. We could call this maybe a buck 75 per cookie, new cheaper price. And then we want to look at, okay, well, what's happened to our quantity of cookies? How many cookies we're consuming? Well, we have two things to consider. We have our substitution effect and we have our income effect to consider so okay let's again let's do this in two different colors income effect let's do blue again for substitution effect because well why not that's what we did last time so okay first thing let's take a look at our substitution effect we have from this initial point we're going to increase our cookies as we substitute for more of the cheaper cookies and then from that point there, right, if you wanted to, you could be like, okay, boom, substitution effect, that's going to bring me out to there. Then I go and I have my income effect such that, hey, because cookies are now cheaper, I have altogether more disposable income. Substitution effect's the big one. Income effect bring me just a little bit farther out. Bring that guy up. And these two together work out to be substitution income. I get my new point right there. And right again, if we want to fully, fully label this, that is my substitution effect, SE substitution effect. This is my income effect, IE income effect. And then if I just connect the dot between these two, I get a listing of what I would have as my personal, my personal demand for cookies. All right, that's my personal demand for cookies, such that, right, and again, I'm just extrapolating. I just did two points. I'm just assuming a linear demand Right, that's actually a big assumption, but it's one we'll just simplify and use because it's 103. And what I've done by extrapolating it is saying that, okay, I witnessed that as my price of cookies falls altogether, my quantity of cookies consumed goes up. And 
what I can end up pulling across this is that, hey, if I had instead a, let's say, I don't know, maybe this is a price of $3. Well, at a price of $3, let's just put that in, I would have some quantity of cookies demanded down there at C3. Such that again, ultimately, as this price rose, the reason I'd get from C1 to C3 would be partly substitution effect, partly I'd feel poorer due to the higher price, so I'd have the income effect occurring as well. So two effects causing the change in quantity demanded, and I get a read off of every possible price of the cookie and the corresponding quantity demanded. Keep in mind, this is going to be that corresponding quantity demanded such that I'm maintaining this optimal ratio between how many cookies I'm having and how much of everything else I'm having, right? So different goods are going to have different rates of trade-off. I might be steeper, I might be shallower, depending on how sensitive I would be to that price. And that price sensitivity is a topic we'll come back to look at in a lot of detail later. But for now, we've derived our personal demand curve broken into two different effects, substitution and income effect. What we'll take a look at next is kind of a one-off scenario for a, I shouldn't say a super rare category of goods, but for another type of goods. And that is we're going to take a look at what happens if we have a price change for an inferior good. That is, although we never actually defined it, although we never actually gave it a name. Technically, what we were looking at up here when we were talking about cookies, we actually made an implicit assumption that cookies were a normal good. And normal good just means that it behaves normally as our income changes. That is the way we'd think it would change. More income, more goods. Less income, less goods. An inferior good is something that actually goes the other direction, right? So let's let's talk quickly about what that means and then we'll move on to the example. So an inferior good is a situation such that when your income goes up, you actually want to buy less of it. You're like, yeah, cool, I have more money, I'm never buying that again, right? For many people, fast food would be an inferior good. It's like, you know, and you have less money, all you can really afford to go eat out is fast food. So if you're going to go eat out, you're going to go for fast food. As your income goes up, though, well, instead of just buying more cheeseburgers from McDonald's, you begin to substitute, you begin to switch. You're like, okay, great, I have more money. I'm going to buy less fast food. And maybe you're eating out at fancier restaurants as a result. Another example of an inferior good, right? Often one that comes up is something like craft dinner mac and cheese, right? Mac and cheese. Such that, okay, mac and cheese is great, right? Your boxes of KD, they're awesome. Probably have them fairly frequently, but it's one of those things where all of a sudden, if you had a million dollars, you wouldn't just be buying a ton more craft dinner. You'd probably buy less, if any, craft dinner if all of a sudden that happened. So, Certain goods, as our money goes up, as we have more income available to us, we say, yeah, great, craft dinner was great when that's all I could afford. Now that I have the money to buy real pasta, sorry, craft dinner, you just don't cut it anymore. So inferior goods are going to be goods that work in the inverse relation with our income. And so let's take a look at how exactly that works out. So what happens when we have an inferior good? So let's take a look at an example of that. So here we have craft dinner, right? So we'll assume that craft dinner is an interior, an interior, an inferior good. And we'll start off at the point such that, hey, marginal utility of craft dinner over price of craft dinner, ah, uh, craft dinner, equals the marginal utility of everything else all over the price of everything else. That is to begin off, uh, to start off, right, we have this optimal bundle of craft dinner versus everything else. What we're then going to want to work through is our personal demand curve for craft dinner. So let's go and draw these axes on the side as well for us to work through. So we have our quantity of craft dinner. 
And we have the price of Kraft Dinner Ore, all right, dollar per unit, dollar per KD, you could say. What we're then going to presume is we have our initial price, we have our initial quantity, and at that intersection we have the point that we are beginning off to consume at. We could call that there, KD1 and price 1. In this case, we're going to presume that the price of craft dinner drops. That is, craft dinner is getting cheaper. So, okay, if we work that out, price of craft dinner is getting cheaper. How does that work through all of this? Well, let's carry that down. Marginal utility of craft dinner all over the price of craft dinner price prime. Marginal utility of everything else all over the price of everything else. In this case here, smaller denominator means bigger overall term. So we're getting more utility per dollar spent on craft dinner. So, okay, how does that work out? Well, we're going to have our substitution effect. We are going to have our income effect. And the two together will ultimately allow this to re-equalize, such that again, we have this margin utility craft dinner equal, right, between the two, back to this initial starting point with new quantities. So, okay, substitution effect, right? We're going to substitute towards the one that's giving us more happiness per dollar. So, KD is giving us more happiness, so we want more craft dinner. And if we get more craft dinner, all else equal, right? We have a fixed income, fixed budget. So more craft dinner means less of everything else. So quantity of everything else, down. The impact that that has on our marginal utilities then, so marginal utility of craft dinner, well, the more craft dinner I have, the less extra satisfaction I get from the last box. And as I decrease my consumption of everything else, well, the extra satisfaction I get from that last unit becomes greater. So quantity down, marginal utility up. Over on my income side, well, okay, what has happened here? Price has dropped. So that is, if prices have dropped, I now kind of have more disposable income to devote between all my goods. So you can kind of think of this as a rise in income. So hey, rise in income. For all of our normal goods, everything else, more income means more stuff. But for craft dinner, this is this is an inferior good, right? This is hey, as I have more money to spend, that means I'm not going to be buying as much of this. I want to put it towards better pastas. So as my income goes up, I am going to witness quantity craft dinner going down. This then goes through to impact our marginal utilities. So marginal utility of craft dinner, both quantities going down, marginal utilities going up. And for everything else, if I'm buying more of it, um, right, right, writing the wrong thing. As I buy more of everything else, my marginal utility, that is the extra satisfaction from the last unit, begins to drop. So, okay, as we go through this, we have conflicting impacts between our marginal utilities and our quantities. Ultimately, these will work themselves through and we'll get to a new equalized point such that the new marginal utility per dollar spent is once again equalized with the marginal utility of everything else per dollar spent. That is, we'll find a new utility maximizing consumption bundle between our craft dinner and all other goods but we still have this conflict between our quantities substitution effect says more craft dinner income effect says less craft dinner uh, how, how do we reconcile this how do we work this guy out well okay going back when we first introduced this we said that our assumption is always going to be that the substitution effect is larger and the income effect is smaller, right? And yeah, we can look into special cases where this is not true, but from our case here, we're gonna presume that this is, this is the scenario. 
So if we presume that's the case, let's work through what that means. So we had prices fall. So let's drop our price down. There we go. That is my price two. And then let's go through, same as we have been, substitution effect, I will denote that in blue, and the income effect will be in green. So to start off, graph dinner. Substitution effect, price falls, quantity rises. So okay, we have that there. We rise. That is going to be my substitution effect. My income effect then is saying, okay, quantity craft dinner falls. So, okay, what do we have? Our substitution effect brought us to this point here. Now, the income effect comes in and is going to battle against that substitution effect, bringing us back. Right, it's not going to bring us all the way back. The income effect is going to be relatively smaller. So it just brings us back a little bit, but we still have our income effect, giving us finally where we end up. So substitution effect of the green line, income effect coming back. We have our final quantity, and that's going to be right there. If we again note that point, that's this guy right there. And if we wanted to connect these lines, we would have, right, extrapolating our data from that point, we would be able to get our personal demand curve. So our personal demand for craft dinner, such that some change in price is translated into some change in our quantity demanded. Price drops, quantity demanded rises. Again, the demand curve showing us the relationship between each price and quantity demanded. So in this case here, P1, quantity demanded one. P2, quantity demanded two. So amount of KD had at each point. So that's our personal demand curves. We've now seen how we could derive them, how changes in price cause changes in quantity demanded. We saw this underneath the case of a normal good as we had up here, where the two effects reinforced each other. And then we saw it in the case of an inferior good, such that in an inferior good, the income effect battles against the substitution effect. So, Two effects happening, normal goods, as the name suggests, is where we will normally be dealing with, but we can evaluate inferior goods from time to time as well. From this, what we're then going to take a look at is this idea of the demand curve, our personal demand curve, up to creating our market demand curve. So let's take a look at that guy there. So for our demand curve. So let's take a look at it. Let's presume that we have person one and their demand for cookies, person two and their demand for cookies, and then all together we're going to have the market and the market demand for cookies. So quantity cookies, quantity cookies, and quantity cookies. This is person one, this guy here, person two. And over here, we're going to have our market for cookies all together. Price of cookie, price of cookie, and price of cookie. So we're going to presume, let's, oh, that's not the tool. Try that again. Let's start off at our initial price point, and we'll go up in three price points all together. Let's take a look at how they'll work through. Uh, let's see if I can get this roughly being the same scale as we go. There we go. So let's presume that our possible prices for cookies are $1, $2, and $3. We'll start off by saying, hey, at $3, well, person one, Person one equating their marginal utility from cookies to marginal utility of everything else goes, yeah, $3, I, I don't really want very many. And we get 
a quantity of cookies demanded of, let's say, two. Person two similarly goes, yeah, $3, that's, that's quite pricey. That's quite pricey. Maybe person two, they actually like cookies a little bit more. Maybe they're homogenous. Maybe they're the exact same as person one, in which case we would have two. But let's just make it a little bit different. Let's say that person two has a little bit of a higher preference. So even though this is three, uh, three dollars, we'll say that person two, they, they'd actually want three cookies at three. They prefer cookies despite the higher price. That means all together in the market, what do we have? Well, all together in the market, we would have two cookies demanded from person one, three cookies demanded from person two, giving us all together a market demand of five at a price of $3. So at a price of $3, our quantity demanded is five cookies. What happens? Well, as our price drops, we end up having our substitution effect. We have our income effect, right? The two reinforce each other if this is a normal good. And that would bring us to, let's say, falling price. We re-equalize our marginal utility per dollar spent across all goods. And now person one, person one now wants five cookies. Person two, same idea. Price drops, they re-equate their marginal utility per dollar spent from all goods, and they are now at six cookies. So altogether, what do we get? We have five and six giving us in our market five and six in our market giving us eleven altogether. In this way, right, we could visualize, we could extrapolate downwards assuming linearity, and we can see kind of how each of these personal demand curves would take shape, and very similarly, our market demand. So this would be personal demand for person one, personal demand for person two, and our market demand all together. All right, finally, we could do the last one here. Price continues to fall. We could be a little bit explicit here. We can say, okay, as price falls, we have our substitution effect. We have our income effect. These two effects together are going to yield our new, nope, not quite at the right point. There we go. Are going to yield our new quantity demanded. And let's say this case here. That there is eight cookies. In this case, person two will presume that that's nine cookies. So altogether, eight and nine, that's going to give us 17. And that way, there, by aggregating horizontally, just like we did with our supply curve for each individual firm's supply, right, their marginal cost. We did the same thing here. We aggregated each individual person's demand for a good in order to achieve the market demand for the good. You could imagine if we went through this and we threw in another person, if we had three people we were aggregating, maybe there was another person who was identical to person one. We had two of these guys. Well, what would happen? Well, at this point, we would have, all right, at this point here, we would have two. We would then have another two. We would have a three. So what's that four and three give us seven? We would now have a point being what? Somewhere out there? Something like that. That's seven. Same idea. If we had two person ones, we'd have a five. We would then have another five. We would then have a six. So five and five is 10. Six is 16 something like that, on and on and on. That is by adding more people that we're aggregating to this market, we end up shifting that market demand curve out to the right. Same prices, right? Same price, but we have higher quantity demanded at every price listed. So adding more people, just like with our supply case, adding more firms, 
just would shift these curves to the right. Alternatively speaking, if we took away people, these curves would shift back to the left, similarly. Okay, as we talked about with our supply curve, very similarly, this demand curve has a few different interpretations. So let's just take a look at a generic, a generic demand curve. We'll have price, we'll have our quantity, and we'll have our demand. So the one, the basic kind of definition for this curve is our demand curve, which in that case there, what it's telling us is for some price, for some price, this is our quantity which is being demanded. So that is if it is $3 for a cookie, we will all together, everybody in the market maybe consumes 500 cookies. Right, where do those numbers come from? I just made them, up, right? I just made them. Up. So, okay, at a price of three, the market altogether has a quantity demanded of 500. Well, we could think of this the other way. Instead of, hey, here's a price of $3 and a quantity demanded of 500, we could say instead, hey, if you wanted to get me to consume 500 cookies, what is the highest price that I would pay and still consume those 500. Well, in this case here, 500, highest price I would pay would be $3, right? If you charged $2, well, yeah, I'd consume 500. I'd likely consume more, but what we get is that, hey, at a quantity demanded of 500, the most I would be willing to pay, that is, my maximum willingness to pay for 500 cookies would be $3 per cookie. So just like we worked out before when we were talking about trade, we had this idea of maximum willingness to pay, minimum willingness to accept. Same idea that minimum willingness to accept was attached to our supply curve. This maximum willingness to pay is attached to our demand such that we can say, yeah, yeah, okay. Sure, I would consume 500 cookies. This is everybody in the market would consume altogether 500 cookies, but the most they would pay for 500 cookies is $3 per cookie. All right, that's the highest price they would pay per cookie to get that. We have a final definition that we can think about with this as well. Instead of our demand, so again, demand is saying, hey, at $3, this is our quantity demanded. Maximum willingness to pay is saying, hey, in order to get me to do this, that's the highest price. Our final definition that we could consider would be a marginal benefit, right? And again, marginal benefit, this marginal word, that would be the change in benefit for a change in quantity. So I can kind of work out, okay, if I were to monetize the benefit I get from cookies, I could work out, hey, what's the extra benefit I get? from consuming an extra cookie. And right, we could, we could do this in this kind of way. If we presume we are at 500 cookies and we are right here at our price of $3. And you were to go from 4.99 up to 500, right? That marginal, that incremental change such that, hey, you'd be cost an extra $3 to buy that last cookie Let's write that down. Cost of three dollars to buy that last cookie. Well, let's suppose that right before you bought that cookie, I were to say, hey, hey, hold up, hold up. Instead of buying that cookie, I will give you, I will give you. 301, right? Well, if you're a rational person, you're like, oh, well, okay, you're gonna give me 301. To me, that last cookie consumed, 499 up to 500, to me, the benefit I get from that last cookie is $3. That's why I was willing to pay $3. In this scenario, you're like, okay, I could take your $3, and then profit one cent off of that. Woo, 
right? I'm ahead. I am ahead in this scenario. I can still get my cookie and be up. Even if I were to say, okay, I'll give you 301, but you can't get a cookie, right? That's condition of this contract. I'll give you $3.01, but you cannot buy a cookie. You'd still be happy with this because that cookie was equivalently worth $3 to you. So you're still like, yeah, okay, I'm, I, I'm ahead. If alternatively, I were to say, okay, I will give you $2.99 to not get a cookie. So, okay, you're at that $4.99, you're just about to buy the 500th cookie, and I'm saying, wait, 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 before you buy it, I'll give you $2.99 if you don't buy that cookie. Well, in this case, it's not worth it to you. Right? In this case, the marginal benefit, the extra monetized benefit that you received from that extra cookie was $3. So you received the equivalent of $3 worth of benefit for the last cookie, but I'm only offering you $2.99? You're going to say, no way. Sorry, I'm going to buy that cookie. I get more benefit, more value from that cookie than I do from your $2.99. Not worth it to me. Final scenario, what if I were to say right before it, hey, before you buy that cookie, I'm going to give you $3. I'll give you $3 not to buy that last cookie. Well, okay, at this point here, we're kind of in a bit of a conundrum. We would say that at this point, you are kind of indifferent. That is, you value both of these exactly the same. That $3 I give you, is equivalent to the value you would obtain from that last cookie. And so in this way here, you'd be indifferent. Maybe sometimes you would go for the cookie, maybe sometimes you would take the cash, but there's not a preference that you would have for one over the other. So that is, you can also think of this demand curve as a marginal benefit curve. How much extra benefit, how much extra value I get from consuming an additional cookie. And what we notice with this is that our marginal benefit, right? You can also say this is marginal value, is decreasing. That is, you can think about it, right? The first cookie ever, first cookie in this market that's bought. The marginal value, the marginal benefit received from that first cookie is massive, right? First cookie ever, someone would have to give you a lot of money to find this indifference point, right? Maybe this is something like 10 bucks. That is, right? If it was the last cookie in the world, there we go, one cookie. In order to get this one cookie, you'd be willing to pay $10 for it. That's it, one cookie, no more. You'd be willing to pay 10 bucks for your first cookie. But very similarly, the reason why you're willing to pay $10 for it is because that is the value, the marginal value or the marginal benefit that you place on it. That is what you figure it is worth to you. And that is thus the value you receive from it. As we consume more and more cookies, well, our marginal utility or satisfaction falls, the cookies are not worth as much to us anymore. And thus the value we place on the cookies or the extra value, the extra benefit we get from every additional cookie falls as well. So just like our supply curve, our demand curve also has three interpretations. The demand interpretation saying, hey, here's a price, how much do you wanna buy? A maximum willingness to pay interpretation saying, hey, if you want me to buy 500, the most I'd be willing to pay for that 500 is $3 a unit. And a marginal benefit interpretation saying, hey, hey, for that last cookie consumed, $4.99 to $500, I get an extra value, an extra benefit equivalent to $3. So demand interpretation goes price to quantity. Our other two interpretations go quantity to price. That wraps up our consumer theory. That wraps up our derivation of our market demand curve. What we'll be looking at in the next chapters is bringing this market demand together with our market supply to find equilibrium, and we'll move forward from there. That supply and demand, those are the workhorse models of economics. The next video that we'll have, we'll post a little exercise video where we just work through some examples 
of what we've worked through already here in consumer theory. So we'll do a video of exercises, then we'll do a video into supply and demand next week. Until then, if you have any questions, if you have any follow-up parts that we're just unsure, feel free to post to the frequently asked questions on the course site or send me an email.